before, before I begin, I just want to read something. How many pastors are here tonight? Would you raise your hand? I'd just like to read a text for you before I go to my text for preaching. I just have a deep sense that I need to do this. O oh, afflicted one, storm-tossed and not comforted, behold, I will set your stones in antimony, and your foundations I will lay in sapphires. Moreover, I will make your battlements of rubies and your gates of crystal and your entire wall of precious stones. All your sons will be taught of the Lord, and the well-being of your sons will be great. In righteousness you will be established. Maybe I'm reading that a bit more for me than I am for you, or maybe there's something that we both have in common. This week so far, I have been with some of the men that I most admire um, in the ministry. And it is so wonderful to hear all the things that they've told us and they've taught us. It's, it's just such a blessing for me. But at the same time, it's a little intimidating. You hear these men preach their grasp of Scripture and their knowledge and, and devotion and, and so many other things that seem to come forth in their preaching. And sometimes we think, well, where am I to go? Pastor, you need... As, as I hope you know, and as the speakers here definitely would affirm, Christianity is not about conferences. And the men, the men who've ministered here thus far, even though they love to minister to God's men, this is not their life either. This is not reality. Pastor, if you are faithful, you are worth your weight and gold. I sometimes am afraid of notoriety. You know, because the Pharisees wanted notoriety and Jesus gave that to them and then they went to hell. Also, there are passages that warn us about being exalted in one life in order to lose that exaltation in the next. And our American Christianity is so twisted about what it means to be a success in ministry. But you know, someone asked J.I. Packer one time, who's the greatest preacher alive? And he said, you don't know him. As I've around the world in villages and faraway places, I know men who can barely read in their own language. And have planted more churches than all of us put together. And what I want you to know is, is be encouraged. Yeah, if you're like me, you heard some things about preaching so far and you went, that thing he's saying that's wrong, I do that. <laughs> you know, and I don't, let's not take that lightly, but what I want to say is I want you to be encouraged and I want, I want you to go home like me and I want you to take what you've learned, like the things that I've learned. I got up this morning at five o'clock to meet with uh, Dr. Lawson, I, my the thing I asked him is, could you teach me how to preach? <laughs> uh, you know, but don't be discouraged. Realize, go back, study, preach, do the work of the ministry. But most importantly, rest in Christ in what he's doing in your life. One of the greatest ways the Puritan said in which we might glorify God. Is to rest in the providence of God. And be faithful in that. Pastor. He will come one day. And you will see. Your labor's not in vain. And if like me you've seen some areas where. Boy you really need to work harder. Well, praise the Lord. Let's go back and work harder, but not desperate. Not as though someone were chasing us. Let's rest in Christ. Go back, be encouraged, be strengthened, be strengthened. 
I just wanted to, sh- to share that with you. Um, I'm going to talk about Jesus Christ. In that statement is revealed truly how weak preaching is. If it were not for the grace of God, if it were not that we were commanded to say things like that, it sounds like near blasphemy. Like you're going to put the entire ocean in a cup of water. All the sand in the sea, you're going to put it in a, a little sand pen where you might play. And that's the, that's the thing with preaching. That's the anguish of preaching and prayer. Is that we have yet to even begin to comprehend him. And what we have comprehended. We cannot speak. We cannot explain. I have said before that sometimes I stay up at night and I, I hate my brain. I'm angry with my heart. I just sit there and call my lips dumb. Because when you talk about Christ, when you talk about him. It's impossible. Preaching is futile. And like I said before, where where are we to go? Where are we to go? And that's why, especially you young reformers, I want you to know something. So many of you have grasped a certain truth here and there about Reformation. But I can tell you by looking at you, you don't understand. Because you can talk about all the glories of Jesus, but then you need all kinds of other things to make this work. All kinds of other things to draw people. All kinds of other things to be relevant to people. Christ is all in all, but we must do this and this and have this plan and this scheme. And we must be clever, clever here and there in order to make an impact. I want to tell you something that is rot. Give me a preacher who will cut off the arm of the flesh. And preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. I believe that I have weapons that are mighty unto God. And if I were to summarize those weapons, it would be the proclamation of the word. It would be intercessory prayer. And sacrificial love. I don't want to grow up a group of reformers. That take my place one day. That speak all the right things and have all the right books in their library. But they spend more time scheming and planning and learning than they do on their knees. Give me a man who will wrestle with men with only the word of God in his hand. And give me men who will wrestle with God in the night watch. No, we need to do a lot of pruning. When I preach in my mind, in my heart, I am always, always Ezekiel. And I am always in a valley of dry bones and behold, they are very dry and not any scheme or plan or cleverness of clothing or church growth or anything else is going to cause the dead to rise only. God saying, prophesy to the wind. And if you will prophesy, if you will speak forth the gospel, not the gospel plus, but stand out there barren of all hope except the gospel of Jesus Christ, then you will see the wind and you will see the dead rise. So much clutter today. So much clutter So many boys playing marbles with the diamonds of God. Cut yourself from all of that. And stand and preach. And kneel before him. And wrestle with God for men. And live sacrificially. Do you want to see the power of men? Do you want to see the power of God? If you can grow a church and then write a book about it, it wasn't God. 
wasn't God. Well, that was another thing I wanted to say. <laughs> Let's go to our text. I want to talk about the gospel, but before I get there, I need to lay down some very important truths. I want us to go to the book of Exodus. While you're turning there, young men, young men, do you know him? His presence. His power, his anointing. Has he ever come into you in the wee hours of the morning after a night of prayer and grabbed you by the nape of the neck and thrown you on the ground and tossed you around in his violent love? He has ever filled you with the Holy Spirit. So that you're not talking about some third person, you're talking about a living reality that's more real to you than anyone in this congregation right now. Young men, we are not going to change this world just because we've got a few good books in our library. We're going to be able to change this world only because we come to this people and we tell them the God before whom I stand. The God I live with more than men. You've got more than a book. You've got a God. And he is to be called upon and known Trusted in supremely, exclusively. Exodus chapter 34, on with the gospel now. Verse 5. The Lord descended in the cloud and stood there with him, with Moses, as he called upon the name of the Lord. Then the Lord passed by in front of him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness and truth. Who keeps loving kindness for thousands. Who forgives iniquity, transgression and sin. He will by no means leave the guilty unpunished. Now let's take a look at this just quickly. This is a self-revelation of God. In the Bible there are times when God comes down and speaks for himself. And this is one of those cases. It says in verse 6, Then the Lord passed in front of him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God. Now let's look at these, these characteristics. Compassionate, and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness and truth. Who keeps loving kindness for thousands. This is absolutely wonderful. This is good news for man. This is extraordinary news in light of who man is. Who forgives iniquity, transgression and sin. He's not giving us a lecture on necessarily the different types and kinds of sin. What he's doing in the Hebrew way is heaping one term upon another in order to tell us that he forgives all types and kinds of sin. There is no sin that this Yahweh cannot forgive. So far, so good. But now he says, yet he will by no means leave the guilty unpunished. I have just read to you what the Bible is all about. I have just read to you what the gospel of Jesus Christ is all about. I have just expounded to you the greatest problem in all of Scripture so that we could actually say it is the divine dilemma and it is found throughout all of Scripture. And what is this? On one hand, we have a God who forgives all types and kinds of sin. Yet on the other hand, we have a God who will punish every sin committed by every sinner on planet Earth. Now, before I go on to the next foundation stone, I want you to think about something. I want you to think about the importance of the attributes of God. A young kid goes to Sunday school. Does he, does he get lesson after lesson? In most places, he's not catechized. Does he get lesson after lesson on who is God? Absolutely not. He will go all through, usually in most evangelical churches, all through Sunday school. 
He will go all through youth group. And he will not hear one sermon in Sunday school, youth group, or from the pulpit about the attributes of God. And then he may feel the call to ministry. Go on to Bible college. I interview Bible college students all the time with this one question. How many years at your Bible college did you study the attributes of God? I always say how many years. Because the response is puzzling. Years? Well, I had a systematic course for a semester. And in there, we studied the attributes of God. How long? Well, I don't know. It was like a week or... Okay, go on to seminary. In many seminaries, students will come out of seminary and I'll say, in seminary, how many years did you study the attributes of God? Well, I had two semesters and in the second, in the first semester, we dealt with God. Okay, as a pastor now, how many years have you studied the attributes of God and how many years have you preached the attributes of God to your people? And they go, well, I I, I haven't. This is Christianity. This is a religion. It is about God. And no one knows who God is. So that in one breath, a person can say in a typical evangelical church, God is righteous and God forgives all sin and not realize that that is a gigantic, insurmountable contradiction. How can he be righteous? How can he be that way and forgive sin? Let's go on and just look at another text quickly. Let's go to Psalms. Psalms 32. One of the most beautiful texts in all of Scripture. It's also repeated in Romans chapter 4. Verse one, how blessed is he whose transgressions is forgiven. Whose sin is covered. How blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity. This is is this the language of a righteous God? Now, think about what's being said. This God covers sin. This is not the language of a righteous judge. This is the language that we use with regard to a corrupt one. Hold it, you tell me God is righteous, and yet you tell me God covers sin? God forgives all types and kinds of sin, and yet the guilty will not go unpunished? How can this be? It's an absolute impossibility. My dear friend, if you do not understand this, you do not understand the gospel of Jesus Christ. And yet I rarely hear this preached. I rarely hear anyone when they are testifying on the street speak of this. I was with a bunch of preaching at a university in in Europe a few years ago, and I walked out on stage. Everyone, the secular audience, just loaded for bear. They going to eat Puritan that night is what they thought they were going to do. And so I walked out there and I'm praying, Lord, you know, what should I say to this people? And so I said this, I said, now you listen. Tonight, I'm going to share you the share with you the most terrifying truth revealed in the Christian scriptures. Some of you may want to leave. Because it is terrible, terrifying. Brace yourself. They were all ready. And I said, are you ready? Yes, we're ready. Okay, this is it. God is good. And they were like. And one student finally said, and what's the problem with that? I said, you're not. Now, what does a good God do with someone like you? You want God to be righteous. You want him to judge corrupt political regimes and take care of corporate lust. You want him to come down with the hammer on every man. Do you not realize you just called for the executioner's axe to be laid across your neck? How can God be righteous? And yet forgive unrighteous men. Just quickly go to Romans 
I just want you to see that this is a major argument with regard to Christ dying as the sin bearer. Romans chapter 3. Having spoken about sin for three chapters, Paul the Apostle picks up in verse 23, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified as a gift by His grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus, whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in His blood through faith, that Christ, as Martin Lloyd-Jones would always say, was placarded upon the cross, crucified in the, in the religious center of the universe, Jerusalem, for the whole world to see. It was not just a redemptive work. It was a revelatory work. God was revealing something. What was he revealing? Paul tells us this was to demonstrate his righteousness. Why was it necessary to demonstrate the righteousness of God? Says here, because in the forbearance of God, he passed over sins previously committed. You see, here's the problem. Now, like I've said so many times, we understand so little about Satan, but we do know there is a personal being named Satan. He is powerful. He is evil. But we also know that when he rebelled against God, he was justly condemned. And when he was condemned, there was not a philosophical, theological problem in heaven. It was justice. There were no theological, philosophical problems in heaven until The fall of Adam. Adam, eat from this fruit, you will die. He ate. Where was perfect justice? You say, well, the world was cast into misery. All should have been annulled. All should have been destroyed. Mercy was given to a fallen race. Can you imagine the accuser on that day? God, your justice. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? He is to die. Oh, and Noah. Righteous Noah. Sure, your judgment fell upon the whole world. Noah should have died too. And Abraham, your friend, your friend, he lied. He put his wife in jeopardy. Oh, and David, man after your own heart, you call him a son. He's a murderer. And so throughout all of redemptive history, how can you be just and pardon the likes of these? 2,000 years ago, God gave his answer. You want to know how I can provide mercy for a fallen family? Do you want to know how I can show mercy to Noah? Do you want to know how I can call Abraham my friend? Do you want to know how I can call David my son? Look now to Calvary, to my son, for there he dies for them all. You see, we cannot understand the gospel. In the evangelical church, in the Southern Baptist church, you can't understand the gospel unless you understand something about the attributes of God. And then understand something about the radical depravity of man. How can this truth and mercy, righteousness and pardon, how can they meet? How can they kiss? Only in the person of Jesus Christ. You see, Christ dies on that tree and you you revel in the fact that he reconciles you to God and rightly so. But there is some way in which the entire cosmos is reconciled in the person of Christ. And not only that, I believe that in the person of God, only in Christ do we find reconciliation because here is his justice perfectly maintained. And yet mercy pouring out on the chiefest of sinners. Having annihilated every accusation against his justice through the cross of Calvary. My friend, this is not some, well, at least this was not rare news 150 years ago. It was the common stock of gospel preaching. That's why I tell you, this country is not so much gospel hardened as it is gospel ignorant. And it's ignorant of the gospel because its preachers are ignorant of the gospel. Now, we need to talk about the cross event. So let's do that in one I don't know how really to describe this text. Let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5.
Paul has told us so many times about the atonement and the sufferings of Christ. He takes us down a steep ladder into many dark holes with regard to the the indescribable sufferings of Jesus Christ and what he endured on that tree. But just when you think he can go no further, he lights a torch and takes us down further. To 2 Corinthians 5.21, he, that is God, made him, that is Jesus, who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Now, there's a problem when you read this text or memorize this text over and over and over and over is that it becomes something of a cliche. But I want you to know there is something in this text that made John Calvin tremble. There is something in this text that would make any exegete almost say, I will go here and I will go no further. Christ was made sin. Before we can understand that, let's look at the initial statement. He made him who knew no sin. He knew no sin. In our attempt throughout history to keep defending the deity of Christ, many times we miss the idea that this deity was also humanity. The fullness of God. He was man. And he walked on this planet as a man empowered and filled with the Holy Spirit of God. And as a man, he knew no sin. Now you say, yes, brother Paul, that is so true. He perfectly conformed to the Decalogue. Yes, he did perfectly conform to the Decalogue. But let's take this further. There has never been one moment, not one moment, in your life or my life or in the life of all humanity. There has never been one moment when we loved the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind and strength. Not one moment. Do you realize that? There's never been one moment that any of us have loved God As God deserves. Or loved God. As God ought to be loved. Now think about this. What's the greatest command? What's the greatest sin? Maybe you could say breaking the greatest command. To love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind and strength. And we have never done it. Not for one moment. Now look at the man Christ Jesus. There was never one moment. When he did not love the Lord, his God, with all his heart, soul, mind and strength. There was never one moment when he did not love God as God ought to be loved. That puts a whole new idea on the impeccability or sinlessness of Christ. Also, we understand from the writer of Hebrews that he was tempted, tempted in all things. All our temptations, he knew, he experienced, and yet he did not sin. Well, let's put that in perspective. Let's use a a weightlifting analogy here. An Olympic bar weighs 45 pounds. So let's say you put a 45 pound bar on me. And you've got a world class power lifter over here and you put a 45 pound bar on him. And then you come over here and you put two plates on my bar. Now we're up to 135 pounds. I'm doing okay. You put two plates on his bar. He's got 135 pounds. Then you come over and you put two more plates on my bar. So you got 225 now. I'm still okay. You put 225 on him. He's doing just fine. Now you come back and you put two more plates, six plates. Now we got 315. I'm starting to tremble. I know if I let my knees go forward just a little bit, a little bit, I'm going down. You put 315 on him, he's fine. You come over and put another set of plates on me, now I've got 405. And I go down. You put two more plates on him, he's as solid as a rock at 405. You put two more plates on there. You put it up there until you get in the 800s, 900s. He's still standing there. Now, why did I give you that illustration? You and I. The greatest temptation that man ever experienced was like a feather 
to Christ. It's not just that he was tempted just like us to the very same measure and he stood and we did not. He kept standing and 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 went through things you and I could not even begin to understand if we had a millennia to learn it. This is Christ. Now, again, young preachers, let me tell you something. We have talked a lot about expository preaching, but I want to make something very, very clear. If people come and they are amazed at your expository preaching, then let your expository preaching be damned. The purpose of expository preaching is that they may hear great things about Christ and they might delight in Christ and they might forget about you and your technique and your ability and your thought patterns and your reasoning that they will be lost in Jesus. You know, I know you have very little confidence in Jesus when you have to add so many other things to your church to make it work. What about a people raised up on one thing? Christ. All we want to do is hear about Christ from the pulpit. All we want to do is sing about Christ. All we want to do is pray to Christ. And all we want to do is serve Christ. See, this, this Christ just keeps going and going and unfolding and unfolding. And, and that's, that's actually the task of eternity. Spend eternity after eternity after eternity just tracking down the glories of God in the face of Christ. This is Christ. This is the one who died for you. Now, let's go on because we're just running out of time. It says, He made Him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf. What does this mean? Does this mean that somehow... On the cross, that Christ devolved into a corrupt being or became somehow something other than spotless and despicable. I mean, after all, what does it mean? Well, it doesn't mean that. But what does it mean? Well, let's look at the second part of the text. It says, he made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. When a person believes God, he is declared to be righteous. Now, that does not mean that the moment you believe God, you become a righteous being who never sins. What does it mean? It means the moment that you believe God. God grants to you or speaks forth a legal or forensic declaration, you are right with him. You are right with God. You say, yes, justification. There's one more word you've got to include if you're going to understand the cross. Justification means not only that God declares you to be right with him, but that he treats you as right with him. Never forget that word. So now, what, how does that apply to the cross? On the cross, our sins, the sins of God's people, were imputed to the Son. And He was legally declared guilty before God. And He was treated as guilty. In the place of his people. Now, it was an imputed guilt, but it was a real guilt. It does not diminish the suffering. He was declared before the very bar of his father to be guilty. And from that moment, treated as guilty. Now, for the sinner in his corruption, to stand before God is, is indescribable. I hear young men that will often say in their boldness, if I'm street preaching or something, they'll say, I'm not afraid to stand before God. I remember Charles Leiter taught me, he said, young men will speak that way. But when they stand before God, they'll melt before him like a tiny wax figurine before a blast furnace. Even in our corruption, 
We will wrench away from His holiness. We will suffer before His righteousness. How much more when Christ, His Son, takes our guilt upon Himself. Throughout all of eternity, this relationship in the Trinity of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. But now on that tree, it is broken. And Christ from the very throne is declared to be guilty. And treated as guilty. Now let's go on. In the book of Galatians, we read this. In chapter 3, verse, verse 10, cursed is everyone who does not abide by all the things written in the book of the law to perform them. When preaching is precise, men tremble at words like sin. Men tremble at words like curse. You see, we hear curse. We think, oh, under a curse. But it is the labor of the preacher to expound, to try to explain, what does this mean? You can go throughout the scriptures, Old Testament and New. It's talking about separation. It's talking about condemnation, hopelessness, alienation from God. Let me put it to you this way. The sinner outside of Christ is so vile, so heinous, so, so despicable and loathsome, not only before God, but before every righteous being in heaven, that the last thing that sinner will hear when he takes his first step into hell is all of creation standing to its feet and applauding God because God has rid the earth of him. Cursed. Cursed. When the trees clap their hands and the sea and the waves dance across the sea, rejoicing that you have been removed from creation. With no one, not even a closest kin to pity you, but all raising their hands and saying the God of all the earth has done right. Under a curse. But what does the scripture say? If we turn to Galatians just for a moment. Chapter 3. Verse 13. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law. Having become a curse for us. For it is written. Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. This statement by Paul is so amazing. That he's pulling in Old Testament scripture. To validate what he is saying. That when Jesus Christ was on the cross, he bore the guilt of his people and he became a curse in their place. Now, I want you to think just about a few things. You, you know, the Beatitudes, blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Well, I've taken the Beatitudes. I've turned them around. Instead of a blessing, now a curse. Giving the opposite results. And let's apply that to Christ. The blessed are granted the kingdom of heaven, but the cursed are refused entrance. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. The blessed are recipients of divine comfort. The cursed are objects of divine wrath. The blessed are satisfied. The cursed are miserable, miserable and wretched. The blessed receive mercy. The cursed are condemned without pity. The blessed shall see God. The cursed are cut off from his presence. The blessed are sons and daughters of God. And the cursed are disowned in disgrace. You see, in order for you to come in under this promise of blessing, it was necessary that one come under the curse. In the book of Deuteronomy, there is something that um, is very, very important. We won't turn there, but it's found in chapter 27 and 28. We have two mountains. We have Mount Gerasim from which one camp of Israel was to stand. They were to stand there in Gerasim and they were to pronounce all the blessings that were to fall upon the head of the covenant keeper. 
Another camp in Israel was to stand upon Mount Ebal and to pronounce all the curses that were to fall upon the covenant breaker. Well, you know what camp in which you belong, don't you? Mount Ebal is your mountain. You are a covenant breaker. You have violated the laws of your God. By your own thoughts and your own words and your own deeds, you are guilty. And the only thing that you could ever hope to hear is the mountain. Even Sinai screaming at you, condemned, condemned. Condemned. Mount Gerasim is as far from you as a mountain could possibly be. But on Calvary, Christ interposed on your behalf. And all the curses written in the book of the law that should fall upon you throughout all of eternity fell upon him on Calvary. So what I've done is I've taken these curses And let's take them and relate them to what happened to Jesus Christ on Calvary. When he looks up into heaven as he is hanging on that cross, he cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And as R.C. Sproul once said, God responded, the Lord, the Lord, your God damns you. The Lord send upon you curses, confusion and rebuke until you are destroyed and until you perish quickly. The Lord smites you with madness and with blindness and with bewilderment of heart. And you will grope at noon as one blind man gropes in darkness with none to save you. The Lord delights over you to make you perish and destroy you and you will be torn from the land. Cursed shall you be in the city. Cursed shall you be in the field. Cursed shall you be when you come in and cursed shall you be when you go out. The heaven which is over your head shall be bronze and the earth which is under you iron. You shall be a horror. You shall be a proverb and a taunt among all the people. Let all these curses come upon you and pursue you and overtake you until you are destroyed. Because you would not obey the Lord your God by keeping his commandments and his statutes, which he commanded you. Let me read on from my notes. As Christ bore our sin upon Calvary, he was cursed as a man who makes an idol and sets it up in secret. He was cursed as one who disowns his father or mother. Who moves his neighbor's boundary mark or misleads a blind person on the road. He was cursed as one who distorts the justice to an alien, orphan and widow. He was cursed as one who is guilty of every manner of immorality and perversion. Who wounds his neighbor in secret or accepts a bribe to strike down the innocent. He was cursed as one who does not confirm the words of the law by doing them. There's a passage in Proverbs that says, like a sparrow in its flitting, like a swallow in its flying. So a curse without cause does not alight. But how did it alight upon that spotless lamb? Because he interposed. Because he stood in the place of his people. David cried out in Psalm 32, which we read, How blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. How blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity and in whose spirit there is no deceit. Yet again, I'll read from my notes. Yet on the cross, on the cross, the sin imputed to Christ was exposed before God. And the hosts of heaven, he was placarded before men and made a spectacle to angels and devils alike. The transgressions he bore were not forgiven him and the sins he carried were not covered. If man is counted blessed because iniquity is not imputed to him, then Christ was cursed beyond measure because the iniquity of us all was thrown down on his head. When the gospel is preached. We don't hear these things. I remember one time when the movie. uh, The Passion came out and all kinds of pastors were writing me all angry about so many things about in that movie. 
And I have no bones to pick with Mel Gibson or those who did the movie. As a matter of fact, it provided me an opportunity to write those pastors back and say, I have more problems with your preaching the gospel than I do Mel Gibson's film. Because one of the most foremost evangelicals in the United States came on a radio program and he says, we've heard a lot about this movie. I am going to share the gospel. I'm pulling out all the stops. I'm going to tell you people what the gospel is. I pulled off the side of the road. I was working there on my mom's farm. Shut off the truck, turn the key back on, turn the radio up. Oh, wonderful. Finally. He talked about the nails. He talked about the crown of thorns. He talked about what the Romans did to him. He talked about everything that was in that film, but never once did he mention the righteousness of God and how can a righteous God pardon wicked men? Never once did he mention that the true pain of the cross was not a Roman whip, but the wrath of almighty God falling down upon the head of his son. Let me ask you, do, are we ignorant of these things or do we not delight in them? Congregations do not delight in this cross because possibly the preachers don't delight in this cross. You get one glimpse of this thing. And there is a real sense that it will ruin you. You become a prisoner of it. You can't think about other things. Wake up in the night. The same thing over and over, year after year. How can it be? And can it be that I should gain an interest in this? He would do this. It's absolutely astounding. In the renewal of the covenant in Moab. There's a really unique passage there that, that I think tends to. To push us past it to Christ. It talks about what would happen to the covenant breaker under the Mosaic covenant. And it says the anger of the Lord and his jealousy will burn against that man. And every curse which is written in this book will rest on him. And the Lord will blot out his name from under heaven. Then the Lord will single him out for adversity from all the tribes of Israel. According to all the curses of the covenant which are written in this book of the law. Can you imagine? Have you ever been praying and God show up? My little boy Ian, we were praying. He said, Dad, what's it like when God comes down? I said, son, well, the best thing I can tell you to describe it would be this. You know that in homeschooling, you know that F5 tornado that you were studying about? He said, yes. I said, it'd be like praying. Three feet away from an F5 tornado that picks you up and ravishes you with his love. But oh, how different it will be to be lost on judgment day and to be singled out. All those friends of yours that mocked God with you and somehow soothed your conscience. They're now hiding under the mountains and in caves and holes and you're singled out to stand before God Almighty. Can you imagine that as you're coming through the tunnel out into judgment area, you see all these gigantic hordes of angels and beasts, creation itself, running the other way, screaming, flee from the wrath to come. And as you march in there, you're singled out before him. But on that tree, Christ was singled out. The only covenant keeper the only son of Yahweh, the only servant Yahweh has ever had. He was singled out. And I love this language that in modern times, I want to admonish all you preachers to use this kind of language much more to speak of Christ as the writer of Hebrews speaks of him. It's my favorite way to talk of Christ. My elder brother. The one greater than Joseph. All of us. Puny, wicked. Siblings. All of us vile covenant breakers. With no hope. Nothing of good among us. 
But there was one, an elder brother, who became of our stock. And though he was free from guilt and sin, he pushed us back. He took our place. He bore our curse. In the book of, of, of Numbers, there is a beautiful passage. You'll turn with me just quickly. Numbers chapter 6. Verse 24, it's Aaron's benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance on you and give you peace. When you've read that before, did you ever, as soon as you read that, say, red flag, big red flag, hold it. I mean, there's enough here to make shake you up with regard to the inerrancy of Scripture. You ought to be thinking to yourself, hold it. He's blessing a wicked nation. He's shining his countenance on people that, as we can see before and after, are rebelling against him. How can a righteous God pardon this people? How can a holy God bless this people? There's only one way. Everything. Everything. Everything in the Bible points to the Lamb. And I will dare say, if you read the Bible correctly, you will find it hard to make sense out of any of it. Apart from the Lamb. Why is this blessing why does it belong to the people of God? Well, let's turn it around and apply it to Christ. The Lord curse you. The Lord give you over to destruction. The Lord take the light of his presence from you and condemn you. The Lord turn his face from you and fill you with misery. Have you ever said this? I'm blessed. Well, I praise God you should say that. It's all throughout the book of Psalms. You should cry out to the whole world, I'm blessed. I have a dear friend of mine, a dear, dear friend and colleague. It, it goes without exception if you say, Dr. Barry, how are you doing? The answer is going to be, I'm blessed. But now I want you to learn something that will not take that blessing away from you. But cause you to esteem it more. You're blessed. Yes, you are. And Ephesians tells us chapter one. Paul, the apostle, laboring with all the might of spirit and intellect. You and I cannot even begin to understand how blessed we are. But how are we blessed? He was cursed. You see, the, 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 the Christian who knows God is something of a paradox. Because he cries out with the greatest of joy, I am blessed. But behind that joy is a trembling heart. That never forgets, I'm blessed because he's cursed. I'm blessed because he was cursed. I'm blessed because he was cursed. It's all about him. It's all about him. Sometimes I look at church websites, and probably after this, many of you will turn, change your, web, your church websites, and I don't mean you to do that. But there's a real danger when I go to your website, and what you promote there is your beautiful community on the front page. And I don't read anything about the beauty of Christ. Are you trying to hide the scandal? Are you trying to make beautiful young people your drawing card in your church? I was with Conrad and Bewe several years ago and we were both preaching in Eastern Europe. And he had had enough of American church growth techniques brought over to Western Europe. And with that voice and the power that he had, he said, you young men. I can't copy him very well. You young men, you want to know how the Apostle Paul evangelized pagan nations? You want to know how he went through the greatest cities of antiquity? Get you a sign and write on it, Christ crucified and walk through the city. I'm so tired of seeing all your fancy haircuts and clothing and beautiful people and this and that. But I have to go back to page 10 to find anything about Christ. 
If people do come, you're leading them into idolatry. It should be Christ. Our only drawing card. If you use carnal means to attract carnal men, you'll have to continue using carnal men means to keep those carnal men. And I just described American evangelicalism and the reason why it is a six flags over Jesus. And sometimes, pastors, I, I weep for, because I think this. Do the pastors think so little of Christ that they feel like they've got to put something else out there as a drawing card? Pastors, this is a little departure, but I'm known for that. And everyone knows I don't have a Ph.D., so I can do this. <laughs> pastors, listen to me. If my wife was in Walmart and she went out to the car at about 11, had to go there late because my daughter's sick and three men or four men grab her and accost my wife and you walk by. And because of fear, you do nothing. I'm going to hunt those men down. And then afterwards, I'm coming for you. Another thing, Pastor, I have a little girl. Her name's Rowan. She's five. She's the delight of my heart. My little Rowan. And let's say that I have to go on a long journey and I bring her to you dressed in a simple white gown because she's just like her mother. She doesn't need anything. She's so beautiful. Those big eyes. Little white slippers. And I take her and I give her to you. And then I go away on a long journey. And when I come back, I found out that you have prostituted my little girl. You have dressed her up in the garb of the world. You've painted her eyes and fixed her hair with one sole purpose, Pastor, to make her attractive to carnal men who hate me. That's what a lot of pastors in America have done, and it's the reason when the lamb comes back, they are going to crawl in holes with the rest of them. I see huge churches, and I see in those huge churches many times, 20, 30, 40, sometimes in a bigger church, 100 people. All they want is Jesus. All they want is to hear the word of God preached. All they want is to worship. And they don't need the worship propped up by something. They don't need smoke. They don't need fire. They don't need drama. They just want to sing to Christ and pray. But they're over there starving in the corner as the pastor caters to all the carnal, wicked people who never want Christ. Oh, pastors. Don't do that. Don't do that, young man. Don't start your ministry that way. Don't. Don't. Well, let's get back to our text. In the Garden of Gethsemane, and I bring these out because these are points of things I've heard preached in sermons often enough to make it bother me. That we hear about Christ in Gethsemane and he's saying, let this cup pass from me three times. He cries this out to the father. This is extremely unusual. Again, we're getting this view of humanity. And when we walk through this corridor, we need to be very, very careful because this is this things are going on here that is beyond us. But Christ is confronted with the reality of the cross. I hear many people say, yes, Christ in his omniscience, he looked forward and he, you know, he saw the cat of nine tails coming down on his back. He saw the nails being nailed in his hand. He saw the spear put in his side and he 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 wept there in anguish and cried out to the father and sweated drops of blood. No. No. And I can prove it. Christ wasn't weeping in that garden because he had fear of a Roman whip. I can prove it because after he died and rose again from the dead and ascended up into heaven, we have a long history of Christians being crucified in Rome. And we are told in studies of martyrdom that many of them went to Roman crosses with their chests sticking out, with their head held high, singing hymns joyfully, counting it a privilege to suffer for the Messiah. Are you going to tell me that the followers of Jesus Christ died joyfully on crosses? Some of them set a fire while the captain of their salvation cowered in a garden. 
I remember one time preaching in a, in a reform school. That means a school that was really reformed. And it was, these, it was a spectacular school and these, these students. And I'll never forget, I, I go in there and I say, um, I told the professor, he said, what are you going to preach on? I said, propitiation. And, and I said, Who, how old are the students? He goes, well, they'll be in there from first grade to 12th grade. I said, well, that makes it kind of difficult. And he said, not here. And so I started preaching. And finally, I got this question. I said, what was in the cup? What was in the cup? And this little girl, she couldn't have been more than nine years old in truly reformed fashion. She raised her hand. I said, yes, dear. She stood up and stood beside her desk and she said, sir, the wrath of almighty God was in the cup. Out of the mouth of babes. Out of the mouth of babes. Now, I want to read to you. Listen to the words of the psalmist. For a cup is in the hand of the Lord and wine foams. It is well mixed and he pours out of this. Surely all the wicked of the earth must drain and drink down its dregs. Jeremiah, for thus the Lord, the Lord God of Israel says to me, take this cup of the wine of wrath from my hand and cause all the nations to whom I send you to drink it. They will drink and stagger and go mad because of the sword I will send among them. What was in the cup? The wrath of God was in the cup. Now, I've read this in a few places, just something I want to point out to you. Again, I said we have to be very, very careful. But I have read a few of the older, older, older writers that they took from actually from from Luke chapter one, where it says that Christ grew in in stature and wisdom. And then from the passage in Hebrews five, eight, where it says he learned obedience. And some have suggested this. That as Christ grew, and this is so amazing, that as Christ grew as a young man, came to understand more and more what it meant for him to be the Messiah and the Redeemer of his people. He grew in wisdom. I know this is astounding. And what if, as he grew, the cost of redeeming his people, a glimpse of it was given to him and it hit him in the chest like a truck, like a charging bull. And he was stained and he said, not my will, but yours be done. And then as time goes on, a greater revelation of what it would cost. And it hit him in the chest like a charging bull. And he said, not my will, but yours be done. And finally, on that last night in Gethsemane, all the fullness of what would be poured out upon him. The wrath of almighty God. Abandonment. Everything for his people. And he cries out. Let this cup pass from me. And then doing battle. He stands victorious. And he stamps his feet. And throws back his shoulders. And says not my will. But yours. And he goes to the tree. I'm a. Amazed at the passage in Zechariah, awake sword against my shepherd and against the man, my associate, strike the shepherd. Now, I want you to think for a moment, just for a moment. You try to find an illustration to fit this. It just doesn't work. But imagine a dam a thousand miles high and a thousand miles wide and filled to the rim with water. And your little village, an eighth of a mile away at the very bottom of the dam. And one morning you awake to an explosion. It seems that literally the earth is being cracked in two. You run to the window only to see a thousand mile high wave coming straight for your village. Fleet of foot cannot escape. The strongest swimmer, there is no stroke. And in that terror, paralyzing terror. In a moment, the ground opens up. Swallows down the wave and not even one drop is splattered on the leg of your pants. So the wrath of God should be poured out on you. And upon me and upon the world and Christ opened himself up to it and drank it down. He extinguished it. He put it away. He exhausted it. 
Imagine this, two great millstones, one 10,000 pounds and another on top, and they're moving in opposite directions. And you take a grain of wheat and you put it in there, and for just a fraction of a second, the hull compresses and then explodes and is ground to powder to nothing. So Christ is crushed under the wrath of God. You see, God is just. That justice must be satisfied. If that justice is not satisfied, wrath cannot be appeased. And it is not like so many have said, even in the Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe, the film version of it, it is portrayed all wrong. When Edmund has betrayed everyone there in Narnia and Aslan tells Peter, Peter says, just go down and get him. He says, I can't. Why? And basically the idea is that there is some principle For our case, let's say principle of justice over Aslan that even he has to obey and cannot violate. And I've heard people say there is a rule of justice that God himself cannot violate violate, as though there were some external law outside of God to which he had to submit. That's absolutely preposterous. Then what was it? God had to satisfy his own justice. And in satisfying that justice, he appeased his wrath. He appeased his wrath. Now I want to read from you my favorite, if you want to know my favorite author, or at least one of them. And his favorite book is, is John Flavel in the Meditorial Glories of Christ, Volume 1. Wow. And he says things like, If I gain glory, it is only a paper glory because I write as one who writes by moonlight. He says, even in the glorious things he's writing in that volume, he says, I'm writing as a man who's not standing in full sun, but only one that is in the writing in the in the dim light of the moon. Brothers, read men who loved Christ, were enamored with Christ, needed nothing but Christ, and you'll throw away all this other stuff. Throw it away. I can tell you this, and I'll tell you this tomorrow about prayer. The more you cut yourself off from the arm of the flesh, the more you will see the power of God. The more you cut yourself off from the trinkets of modern day evangelicalism and you focus on Christ and turn your people's eyes toward Jesus, the more you will see the power of God. Of God, but Flavel, he writes what I've called the father's bargain. It's a it's a story in which he has the father and the son speaking to one another in eternity past. And the father speaks, he says, my son, here is a company of poor, miserable souls. That's you and me. That have utterly undone themselves. And now lie open to my justice. Justice demands satisfaction for them or will satisfy itself in the eternal ruin of them. What shall be done for these souls? And then Christ speaks, O oh, my father, such is my love and pity for them. That rather they shall perish eternally, I will be responsible for them as their guarantee. Now, I want to point out something. I'm not exegeting scripture, but I want you to think of something here. Much has been made of Christ dying for God and Christ dying for the glory of God. Now, you cannot overemphasize that truth, but be very careful when it becomes a cliche and a fad. Because I want you to know. When I stand out on the street preaching or anywhere else, I raise my voice to men. And I say, Christ died for love. And Christian, I want you to know something. It's not some cold covenantal transaction agreement that he made for some cold purpose to honor himself. It was within the context of undiminished love. Listen to me, Christian. He really died because he really, really did love you. And that's amazing. And in all our reformed language, that is very true. Make sure you do not get distorted. Because see, once people are truly converted... If you would just preach the gospel and the people in your church get converted, then it is love. 
telling them much about the love of Christ for them that will lead them to piety. That will lead them to piety. And sometimes I think that preachers, especially doing evangelism, are almost balking at talking about the love of God for sinners. Don't try to make your theology so perfect that it becomes cold steel. I do not understand many of the things that have to do with the gospel or prayer or so many other things. So I've taken the route of Spurgeon. Instead of trying to make a perfect system, I just want to proclaim what Scripture says. And if over here it says something about the glory of God, I will preach the glory of God. But if Christ died for sinners because he loved sinners, then I scream to sinners, Christ died for love. Don't be afraid of that. He says here, oh, my father, such is my love to and pity for them that rather they shall perish eternally. I will be responsible for them as their guarantee. Now, listen to this. Bring in all thy bills that I may see what they owe thee. Bring them all in. So many times a young man will get married full of poetry and come back six weeks later saying, what have I done? I didn't know what I was getting into. Not with Christ. Bring in thy bills, Father. Bring them all in. See what they owe thee. Now, here is one of my most favorite things ever written by the hand of man outside of inspired scripture. And if you can get a hold of this, you will have great joy. He says, bring in thy bills, Father, that I may see what they owe thee. Lord, bring them all in that there may be no after reckonings with them. Do you do you hear that? Bring in every bill, all of them. And when I pay all of them, there is no after reckonings. There is nothing left for Paul Washer to pay. I'm free. I'm free. I'm free. And you say, you tell people that they won't live in piety. No, you tell carnal churchmen that and they won't live in piety. You tell regenerated souls this truth and with their freedom they will worship and serve. And the issue here, folks, another sermon, but I'm going to put it in here. The issue is not lordship salvation. The issue is regeneration. The same God who justifies, regenerates the soul so that it wants to submit as Lord. It is not taking on a new rule or some work. It is a new creation. The power of God. He goes on. That there be no after reckonings with them at my hand. Thou shalt require it and I would rather choose to suffer their their wrath than they should suffer it. Upon me, my father, upon me be all their debt. And then the father responds, but my son... If thou undertake for them, thou must reckon to pay the last might. Expect no abatements. On the Amazon, we would be going down through there. And and my boat just most of the time never had a roof on it. And going down through there. And all of a sudden you see a storm come up on that Amazon. And you know you have no time to get to the side. That storm hits you. Your boat's going under. I mean, fill up a boat in a matter of five minutes. And you're praying that the storm might abate. Let it abate. Let it go to one side or the other. Let it stop. If this storm hits me, I'm gone. He says, son, if you're going to undertake for this people, expect no abatements. If I spare them, I will not spare you. Content, father, let it be so. Charge it all upon me. And I love this statement because it shows Christ. He says, charge it all upon me, Father. I am able to discharge it. Isn't that wonderful? I mean, look at him. I am able. No angel, no seraphim, no cherubim, nothing. No one can say that. Except deity. I'm able to discharge it. He is able. He is able. 
And though it prove a kind of undoing to me, though it impoverish all my riches, empty all my treasures, yet I am content to undertake it. Now let's close. We have, you know the story. God comes to an old man named Abraham. And he says this. Now take your, now, now listen to this. I'm more Puritanist kind of, well, I don't want to blame what I do on the Puritans. But I see Jesus everywhere. You'll just have to forgive me. He says, now take your son. Your only son. Whom you love. Isaac. And go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I will tell you. And that old man. Takes his son. Now I have two sons. I, I can't even begin like Dr. Beaky was talking about, you know, he would never give you his son. I could not give you my son. He's commanded by God to go offer his son. And so he goes to the Mount of Moriah. He pulls out a knife after laying the boy upon the sacrificial bed. He draws back possibly the same flint knife he used to circumcise the boy with hope. Pulls back the knife. And right when the old man's will gives in to the will of God, God stops him and says this, Abraham, Abraham, do not stretch out your hand against the lad and do nothing to him. For I know that you fear God since you have not withheld your son, your only son from me. We read that we realize that he turns around and there's a ram in the thicket caught by its horns. The ram is slaughtered in the place of the son and we all Breathe a sigh of relief. The story's over. What a beautiful ending. It's only one problem. It wasn't the ending. It was the intermission. You see, the blood of bulls and goats will not take away sin. Generation after generation passes. And now the curtain in the theater is pulled back once more. And there's no longer Isaac. There's one greater. Than Isaac, the son of God, his son, his only son, whom he loves, is hanging on a tree. And God takes the knife from Abraham's hand. And slaughters his only begotten son. Calvary. Our sins weren't paid for because a bunch of Romans beat up Jesus. They weren't merely paid for because he was nailed to a tree or a spear was put in his side, which is the theme of every Easter weekend. How many Easter sermons have I heard? Only. Of what the Romans did to Jesus. And hardly have I ever heard. That he was crushed under the wrath of God. And he died. And in dying he paid for our sins. And on the third day. He rose again from the dead. Romans 1 tells us it was the public declaration. That he was the son of God, a public declaration of his deity, a public declaration, many miss this, of his kingship. Romans 4 tells us that it was a public declaration that his death truly satisfied justice and appeased God's wrath. The book of Acts tells us that the resurrection proves that there is a Christ, there is a Lord, there is a king and there is a judge. And as Joseph was in a moment taken out of the prison. And was made to stand before Pharaoh. And Pharaoh said to him, without your permission, not one person shall raise his hand or foot in all of Egypt. So Jesus Christ was presented the son of man before the father and he sat down at his right hand. And the father said to him, not one foot, not one finger will lift in all the universe except at your hand, my son. The gospel. Now, what are you to do? 
You are to repent of your sins and believe the gospel. How dare we cheapen such a message with now raise your hand, close your eyes with tricks and gimmicks to get people to pass forward. And when they pass forward to counsel them for two or three minutes. Two or three minutes, because it's really easy to get them to pray the prayer. No, we we call men to repent of their sins and to believe the gospel. And then as not only proclaimers, but as scribes, we sit with them and we show them what the Bible says about repentance. And we ask them, has this become a reality in your life? We show them faith and we ask them, has this become a reality in their life? We tell them to call upon the name of the Lord, but we have the authority only to tell them the gospel and tell them the principles of biblical assurance. No pastor has the authority to pronounce someone saved as is done all the time in almost every evangelical church in America. When you preach, know this young person, especially if you're going to be an evangelist, your work begins when you come out of this pulpit. It is not uncommon for me to stay in a church till three in the morning. Doing what? Dealing with souls. Dealing with souls. Until they're brought to an assurance. And then after they come to an assurance. To give them gospel warnings. Telling them young man tonight if you have believed. Then you are it truly saved. And there seems to be some evidence of God's work in you. But know this. If you do not continue on. If you depart from this, if you go back into the world, if there is no discipline, if there is no going on with the Lord, if there is no sanctification, then know this. You got nothing here tonight under the preaching of this preacher. Make your calling and election sure. The gospel. Must not only be preached correctly, but men must be called correctly must be dealt with correctly. And it is costly for the preacher to labor until Christ is formed in them. If you're here tonight and you're troubled about your soul, you don't know if you're Christian, then I, as well as others, will stay here if necessary, as long as necessary. To show you in the scriptures. God's salvation. God have mercy on you and bless you.